I want you to try and think of your earliest memory. And sometimes those memories are shaped by what other people tell us, how they remember things. And then try to go back a little further. Try to remember your earliest memory of church, of faith, of what that was like. Now, when, when I was a wee little fella uh, with very copper red hair, I went to a VBS that was, I think, run by my sister at the time, too. And it was at somebody's house. I remember being in a house, not in a church building. And at the end of each day, we would pray. And during that prayer time, I discerned that this is an opportunity where the lines of communication are open to God, so I better get in there. So while they were praying, I prayed my own little prayer, my salvation prayer. I put my little hands together, and I prayed over and over, Dear Jesus, Please don't send me to hell. 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 And I prayed that every single day that week. For whatever reason, that was the impression I had of Jesus. But fortunately, Jesus is the one who comes close. The one who meets us where we are and the one who is gentle enough to correct us lovingly. So that we don't just see him as that one with that lightning bolt ready to zap us as if he's Zeus. In today's story from the Bible, we get this great imagery, this great catch at the time of Jesus with children. And the disciples with children. And what it was like for Jesus. So at that time, where we are in Mark, we're already at the 10th chapter. So we've skipped ahead a little bit from where we were. They've moved around a bit. They are back in Capernaum, of course. This is where they always end up. And as they've gotten there, the religious leaders have gathered around and they try to trap Jesus. And they have this great trap. And and we kind of miss it if we're not really paying attention. They ask Jesus what he thinks about divorce. And we think that Jesus is just, you know, we maybe miss that John the Baptist has recently been killed. Why was John killed? Uh, Because Herod and his wife Herodias in particular did not like him because he was very outspoken that they, they had a very strange relationship that included a violence at some point and divorce uh, and her kind of moving over so that he could be king. So the religious leaders don't actually care about the people that are affected by divorce. Maybe we think of how, how children are affected and other things. They're really just trying to trap Jesus. And, and we see this as a bit of a rhythm that's starting to happen, that people in power are less interested in what Jesus has to say and more interested in what he can do for them. Or they're less interested in what in who Jesus is and more in what that does for them. In fact, Jesus has just had this moment where he's telling his disciples kind of about the future, what, what it's going to be like. It's going to be hard. I might have to die. And, and then they're, they're talking. And he says, well, what are you guys talking about? And they're like, ah. They, they were arguing over which one of them was the best, <laughs> which one was the most important. And Jesus will take a moment to go and pull a child aside. Like, this one's the most important. You've got to be like a child. You have to be humble, not about power. And the disciples kind of keep missing this. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is that Jesus has been tired multiple times. So there's a sensitivity to Jesus being maybe overwhelmed in his ministry. And what we see in chapter 10 is all of these parents, in particular, bringing their children to Jesus so that he can bless them. This is a very normal thing. You would maybe have a priest, your local person, do this. But the parents have kind of discerned there's something special about Jesus. Maybe we get some sort of like extra magical blessing for our kids or something like that. And as the parents go there, the disciples stop them. And maybe there's a sensitivity that you know Jesus has a lot going on. He has a lot to do. He doesn't need this additional distraction. Because that's what children were. A distraction. And we value children pretty highly, I think, in our uh, ethos now. But at that time, kids were a bit more of an afterthought. You were considered a kid up until the age of 12, and then you kind of became a person. You were the, the lowest in the family hierarchy. You, you didn't have the same value. And maybe that's because lifespans were different at that time. We wanted to wait until you were around long enough before you had value. I, I'm not sure. Because we also see children as valued as a way of blessing, but it's a blessing to me. It's about me, not about them. 
So children are kind of at this low hierarchy in the way things go. So the idea of telling parents to stop bringing children to Jesus would be just what you would do for any other religious leader. They're busy, they've got other things going on, and Jesus catches them doing this. And this is the only time in the Bible that we see Jesus, he doesn't just get mad, he gets really mad. Someone say, irate. Like he, he's furious. He says, no, don't stop them from coming to me. Let them come. And then these parents who were just hoping that maybe Jesus would touch their child, maybe if they're lucky, say a Bible verse over them. But it says he, he puts his arms around them. He takes them up. And he blesses them. He spends time with them. And he says, you know what? You can't enter the kingdom of God unless you're entering it like these children are. The kingdom of God belongs to such as, as these children. And see, the trouble is the disciples thought they were doing the right thing. We know Jesus is very important. But they had become a barrier to keep out people who they felt shouldn't be there. And in, in particular, children. They had become a barrier between children and Jesus. Children who seem to naturally know they can come to Jesus and are comfortable in his presence. But the disciples say no. Because kids weren't important enough. They were making choices that, that made sense. We need other leaders, other adults to, to, to be around and to help with these things. That, you know, that's what the kingdom of God is about, right? The kingdom of God, as they understand it, is this, this great coming of, of, of a messianic figure, this new king who will wipe out all of the people who are against us and raise us to power. That's why the disciples are arguing. Which one of us is going to be like the biggest in this new kingdom? This is great. You know, we're at the ground level. The, the earliest form of the pyramid scheme in their eyes. So they not only misunderstand, again, what Jesus' kingdom is about, they also misunderstand the people, the very people, that Jesus wants to draw near to them. And in doing so, they become the barrier. Instead of the ones who are supposed to be the closest followers of Jesus, they become the people who are keeping kids away, keeping those on the outside away. We see that the trouble is that we can be like that. We can be, as a church, a group of people who keep out children. We'll, we'll have things to distract them through the service, which is good. They need to be cared for in some way. But we, we make all kinds of choices in what we do on Sunday mornings, what we do in other avenues of church, based on what we want, based on our preferences. And in a lot of ways, church starts to become something that is a barrier between people and Jesus. Church starts to become the very thing working against what Jesus calls church to be. And that's hard to hear. And it's hard to, to imagine. But that is what the disciples, the closest followers of Jesus, had accidentally become. But Jesus says, no, let them come. Jesus says, those people that you think are, are most important, in fact, through these passages, it comes up over and over again. If you'd like to read through uh, the chapters before, the chapters after, we see powerful people coming to Jesus, people arguing over who's most powerful, people who are coming to him for healing, calling out, have mercy on me, and everyone goes, shh, we're trying to listen to the great words he has to say. Stop interrupting or we have a rich man coming to Jesus saying, hey, I'm doing everything great. What else should I do? Rich people, of course, being the, those blessed by God. Jesus, well, you're right. You're, you're doing a lot of good things. Just, just sell everything you have and follow me. Ooh. Anything but that. These are the people who are the important ones. The religious leaders going, trying to trick Jesus. These are the important ones. But Jesus says, you have to enter the kingdom like a child. This isn't some childlike innocence. 
as if we're getting children before whatever age they become more difficult or more sinful, as if anyone who's ever had children didn't immediately know that children can be pretty uh, self-centered, pretty demanding, pretty sinful on their own, just like us as adults, just like me. What the children came to Jesus with was just themselves. They came with no status. They came with no programs that they expected, no expectations. They came completely powerless. And in that way, that's what the kingdom of God is about. That in fact, the things that we think are important, the things that make us more important, are the very things that can keep us away and keep others away. I remember as a, as a young man, we at one point had the, the hippest it's not a word we use that, but the hippest uh, music at church. We had a whole bunch of musicians, and it was fantastic. And then, as often happens in church communities, there's the battle over what you're supposed to do. People get grumpy with one person, then another person, and suddenly they made these, these very big changes to go back to the good old days, to go back to the old ways we used to do things. And I remember asking, I was like, but we, we, had, we had young people my age, in high school, we have all these other people coming who, who are, are part of these things. Why are we making these decisions? Is this to help them or just to get what we want? And I'll, I'll never forget, and this is the, the leader of the church, not the pastor, it's saying to me, well, you know what, Tim? When you are older, you'll be able to make choices so that church does the stuff you like. But right now, we're in charge. And this is what we want. I don't think that's what church is like at all. <laughs> I hope I never grew up to be a person like that. That doesn't sound like Jesus. <laughs> it, where, where is the denying ourselves, picking up our cross and following Jesus if what, we can't even get over what we want on Sunday mornings, fitting our preferences? But the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. The ones Jesus the one Jesus notices that maybe we don't. Those, those outsiders who have maybe never stepped foot in a church except maybe that one funeral or wedding. Those, those outsiders who feel like if I came to church, everyone would not like me because of who I am, what I've done, what I believe. Those outside people who think, I, I have questions, I'd love to have somewhere to ask them, but you definitely couldn't ask those at a church. As if that's not what the community of God was meant to be as if that's not what the kingdom of God is meant to be, as we, the church, embody those kingdom values of Jesus. But let's take note that Jesus does show us the way in this passage. When they try to get to Jesus, what does Jesus do? He makes a way. Well, first, he, he sees them. Jesus is the one who notices he notices there's a problem, and then he makes a way. He takes away the barriers that are keeping people between at a distance and, and coming to him. Because he sees them, and he loves them, and he knows that he wants them close. And then Jesus gives of himself. He doesn't give them anything extra than maybe we, we would expect. But to them, it was extra. They didn't just get a quick hand and a blessing. They got to be in his presence. They were embraced. I, I always have the sense that Jesus must have been so fun to be with as children because of the things he would do with children. They'd go back and say, Mommy, Daddy, Jesus took my nose and then put it back. And we're like, yeah, yeah, we've seen that before. But I mean, with Jesus. <laughs> Who knows what kind of fun tricks he could do with kids? Who knows? Because he loved children. He loved having them near because... They didn't come with anything. All they wanted was him and to be noticed and to be a part of things. And that is where we are invited as well. You see, we do not come to God as people who have to have our whole lives together or have to be, be all okay putting those masks on on Sundays. We, we come and we are loved just because we are God's children. In the same way that Jesus longs to take away those barriers and wrap those kids in his arms, that is the same love Jesus has for you.
And in that way then, as we experience that love and closeness, we are invited to love like Jesus. To work to take away all of those barriers that get in the way of our children, of those who are maybe afterthoughts, of those who are outsiders coming to Jesus. We are invited to follow Jesus' example of giving ourselves, of being present with others, of being loving and kind and listening and getting down to their level and hugging. The world isn't changed by grand gestures and by great leaders or by great theology and ideas. The world has changed one person at a time as their love. And as that love spreads. So what does this mean for us? Well, we are reminded that church belongs to children. Children like us. Children like the one we had at the front. Because the kingdom of God belongs to children. Children like us. Children like the littlest ones here. We are invited to embody that as a community and make all our decisions as a community so that that is a reality. So that children know that this is their church and that their opinions about Sunday morning, their hopes, their dreams, their theological ideas, their great questions that they have, their their great honesty. That someone would raise their hand and be like, you know what, I don't know. But I wanted you to know I didn't know. (laughs) I wanted to share that. That is what makes church, church the people together, the family together, growing close to Jesus together. And we are invited to emulate children in such a way, because the church is a place that is for children, it's a place that is of children, and it's a place of people who have faith like children. That's who we are called to be. We don't have to have everything figured out. I would love if we ever got to a place where we could raise our hands and kind of joyfully say, you know what, I don't know, but I'm just glad you asked that question. (laughs) And I think one of the greatest challenges we have as we think about what it means to be the Church of Jesus is that we get caught up on, on what was, what is, and what the future of the Church will be. Sometimes we get so caught looking at kids that we think of them as the future of the Church And what can we do so that when they get to the right age, they'll be able to make those right decisions to lead the church? Children are not the future of the church. They are the church right now. The future of the church is not here yet. It is here right now. How will we go? How will we go and and, and embody that? How will we go and make sure that children are a part of things now. So for all of the kids here, for all of the people who are someone's children, that, that's all of us, but first for the kids, let me let, I want to let you know, we are glad you're here. We want you here. We want your sounds. We, we love that you are here. This is your church, and we are not church without you. And that same truth goes for all of us. We are glad you are here. We want you here. We love that you're here. And without you, we are not the same people, the same church. So let's continue to follow Jesus' example. Let's be open to taking down those barriers because there are people within this community, maybe even who could, within range of the microphone, who, who would love to know that there's a place where they could be loved, where they could be welcomed, where they could be themselves and they could ask questions. Will we be that type of church? Will we be the children's church Jesus called us to be? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are good. We thank you that you are gentle, that you are welcoming, and that you're so patient. Lord, continue to have patience with us. Lord, show us what it means for us to have that faith like a child. Help us to receive your love as children. 
as your children. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.